It's summertime and I'm ready to rest, relax, and catch some rays. Well, don't forget your sunscreen. Of course I won't. I also won't forget my Kefla Organics CBD. Good plan. Kefla Organics is one of my favorite ways to relax and enjoy the benefits of CBD, whether I'm at home with a tea reading some true crime or laying at the beach on my day off. Kefla Organics is a fair trade, vegan, refined, sugar-free CBD company. And at keflaorganics.com, you'll find chocolate bars, hot cocoa, chai lattes, and more, making the taking of CBD a lot more enjoyable than a regular tincture. And Murder in the Rain listeners can get 20% off using the promo code RAIN20. So follow at Enjoy Kefla on social media and visit keflaorganics.com. Use the code RAIN20 at checkout to save 20% while enjoying guilt-free, stress-reducing, sleep-assisting, delicious Kefla Organics CBD products. The following episode contains graphic descriptions of child abuse. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Emily Rowney. And I'm Alicia Holland. This is Bill Camp, the voice of Forensic Files 2 on HLN, and you're listening to Murder in the Rain. According to the 2009 Oregon Child Welfare Data Book, there were just over 55,000 reports of child neglect and abuse made to Oregon DHS in 2005. Many of those reports were investigated. Some of them were confirmed while others were closed. But by the end of that year, 18 of those children were dead. Today's case is about one of those deaths, the horrendous abuse that led to the death of three-year-old Carly Sheehan from Corvallis, Oregon. If she were alive today, Carly would be 18 years old. Maybe she'd be planning for college or traveling to Europe to see her family. But she's dead, and her death was prolonged. It was painful, and it was avoidable. Thanks to Carly and the law that followed her death, maybe other children will be removed from their situation before the same fate befalls them. There are a lot of people who may turn away from today's episode because it involves the repeated abuse of a child. Perhaps they feel they're too sensitive and they want to avoid the trauma that those around them endure on a daily basis, or maybe it's just too sad and too hard to hear. To paraphrase Karen Spears Zacharias, the author I interviewed for today's case, imagine how hard it would be to have lived through it if it's that hard to listen to it. The truth is, those of you who are listening are likely not the people who need to hear it. You're here because you enjoy true crime. Maybe you like the way we tell a story or that we focus on the Pacific Northwest. Or maybe it's because sometimes we tell you a case you've never heard before. But whatever the reason is, you're already here listening. Sometimes the people who need to hear these stories are the ones who don't listen to us or they avoid the news or they don't want you to tell them about a case you heard on a podcast because it's too scary, too dark, or it involves children. Those are the people that need to hear it. The fact is, whether people hear it or not, it happens. But the more we know what to look for in child abuse, the faster a child can be saved. Jean and Carol Brill were outdoorsy Christians from Pendleton, Oregon. They're likable, caring, and good-natured people who adopted a baby girl into their family. Sarah Brill became the third Brill child. As she grew up, she was described by most as beautiful, the kind of woman who is eye-catching, not just because she's mixed race in a predominantly white town, but because she's lean, smart, quiet, and charismatic. She had an air about her, never a good girl, but someone people catered to, and Sarah quickly learned how to manipulate people so she could get what she wanted. As a teen, Sarah had trouble with her parents, not an uncommon thing, and she started spending more and more time with one of her teachers, Karen Spears Zacharias. Karen loved Sarah right away, taking her into the family as just another child. She often came over for dinner and spent time with Karen's children. And while Karen loved Sarah like she was her own, Sarah's more negative attributes didn't escape her. Over the years, Sarah exhibited troubling behavior, mainly relying on men to get what she wanted, once even borrowing thousands of dollars from a man to buy a brand new truck and never repaying him. When he finally stopped calling to ask for his money, the repo man came and took the truck away. It seemed she treated men as a means to get the things she wanted, even if it was only for a short while. 
Sarah had gotten pregnant for the first time at 19 years old, and she ultimately chose to give the baby up for adoption. This was an incredibly hard decision for her. She knew what it was like. She too had been a baby that was given away, but she had found herself in a comfortable life surrounded by people who loved her. So while it was hard, it could also be a wonderful decision for her. It was not a traditional adoption. Initially, she actually asked Karen to adopt her baby. But as Karen lived in the same town as Sarah's parents, she thought that it might be too awkward and painful for the Brill family. The family that ended up adopting Sarah Brill's firstborn child lived out of town but had connections to Karen. This allowed enough distance from the family, yet somehow retained a closeness that you would not get adopting out to total strangers. It was hard for Sarah to detach in the beginning. In fact, after giving birth, she nearly changed her mind, and the adoptive family actually asked her to come live with them. After a few weeks, she finally let go and moved out, leaving her baby to be raised by the family. Sarah then turned to Karen for more support and ended up moving in with the Zacharias family. While Karen supported Sarah in any way she could, she also tried to encourage her to pursue college and her career dreams. After spending some time living there and attending community college, she decided to relocate to Corvallis so she could get a job and eventually attend Oregon State University. This is where she would meet David Sheehan, her future husband. David Sheehan was an engineer from Kenmare, Ireland. He found himself in the quaint town of Corvallis in 1996 when he and a couple other hundred Irish employees came to train at the Hewlett Packard campus. After training, David ended up permanently moving to Oregon and eventually met Sarah Brill. The relationship blossomed quickly and the two ended up jetting off to Reno to get married. The Zacharias family thought David was one of the best things that ever happened to Sarah. He was smart and he seemed to have his life in order. Perhaps with the influence of him, Sarah would graduate college and pursue the life they dreamed up for her. Sarah and David were pretty well known in the Corvallis bar scene. Now, I'm not sure how that really sounds, but let me explain it like this. It's a tight-knit community, and I know this because I was raised in it. Both my mother and my stepfather work in restaurant and bar management in Corvallis, and both of them knew Sarah and David and are familiar with the case. When I asked them both about it, the answers were consistent. David was sweet and smart and kind, a really well-liked guy. Sarah was pretty, but she was a bit of a train wreck. Everyone knew she was heavily into gambling, and she used the people around her. My stepfather knew her pretty well because they worked together on a, on a golf course in the pub, and he said that on more than one occasion, she would write a check to the business for cash so she could then go gamble it, but then when they go to cash the check at the bank, they would bounce. So she was constantly in trouble, and David was often left cleaning up after her messes. But that's what you do for the person you love, even if it puts you thousands of dollars in debt. Not long after the two were married, their family started to grow. Carla Isabella Ruth Sheehan was born January 4th, 2002. David Sheehan was thrilled. Sarah now had her own family, But this small, perfect family wasn't going to be something they could hold on to long. Just months after Carly was born, the two of them separated. Sarah called Karen to let her know she planned to leave David. Karen did not agree with this decision. She was basically envisioning a child left to suffer in the lonely aftermath of a messy divorce. So she suggested Sarah try to work it out with him. This resulted in a huge fight between them. Sarah felt unsupported, and Karen worried what life would be like for Carly if Sarah took her away from her loving and responsible father. David had done nothing wrong, no cheating, no lying. Sarah was just bored and wanted to move on. The fight between Sarah and Karen resulted in several years of silence between the two of them. It wasn't until the death of little Carly Sheehan that Karen spoke to Sarah again. A now single Sarah met Sean Field in September of 2004. Sean grew up in Corvallis. If you asked his parents, Sean was a good boy who had a rough time when his older brother died in the early 90s. To others, they saw a teen who was arrested for burglary and the kidnapping of a friend's mom. They saw a man who was into drugs and dangerous behaviors, a control freak who was no stranger to lying to the people who loved him. 
When Sean met Sarah, the two went from zero to 60 in days. Soon they went from single parents raising their own children part-time to a family of four with Sarah's daughter, Carly, and Sean's daughter, Caitlin. David Sheehan was not happy with the sudden fixture in Sarah's life. He often suggested that she try to spend her time with Carly away from her boyfriend. It concerned him that she moved so quickly with a new man, someone who would be spending time with his daughter. And he was not the only one with concerns on this. Carly's daycare provider, Daylin Zoller, started noticing a rapid change in the normally happy and sassy Carly in the fall of 2004. First, there was the very odd experience that Daylin could not get out of her head. Sarah brought Carly to daycare with a new and startling pixie haircut. Carly always had long, beautiful blonde hair and just the day before had it braided so she could play princess. When she asked about it, Sarah pulled out the braid that had been in her purse and showed her this incredibly matted length of hair. She told her she couldn't get the knots out and ended up having to cut it. Daylin wondered what could have caused such significant matting in a toddler's hair in just one night. Then, not long after, the child's hair started falling out. She brought up her concerns to Sarah, and Sarah described that the hair loss was normal. It ran in her family. But little did Daylin know that Sarah was adopted, and even if someone in her family had a genetic issue with hair loss, there's no way that could have been passed down to Carly. There were other concerns too. On a few occasions, Daylin would engage with Carly, hoping to uncover what was happening to her as she appeared to be very stressed and showing up with mysterious bruises. Carly mentioned to her that her daddy hits her and that her daddy bites her. Daylin was very questioning about David. She didn't think he would ever do these types of things, but it's alarming when there's a child clearly reaching out for help and telling someone that she trusts that someone at home was hurting her. On another occasion, Daylin witnessed Carly playing pretend with a toy telephone. She heard the young girl doling out fake punishments to her father for going potty on the floor. It was clear that it was a role reversal, that she was perhaps reenacting something that had happened to her. Daylin questioned the term daddy because she was a regular fixture in this child's life and she could see a difference in the girl based on the custody schedule. Her parents often alternated weeks. So on weeks when Sarah had her daughter, Daylin noted that Carly was always tired, she was hungry, and she would regularly cry for her father. There were days when the child would even sleep for up to six hours at daycare, which is completely abnormal. She also knew that Sarah was in a relationship with a new man. Having been a provider for many years, she unfortunately was not new to these types of warning signs. Daylin often tried to gently probe for more information from Carly. She uncovered that Sarah was working at night when Carly was in her care and that in her absence, she was leaving the child with her boyfriend, Sean, who also had a daughter. She even told Daylin that she didn't like being there with him and that he spanked her. She brought up her concerns to David and insisted that he take her to the doctor. He agreed, and she reminded him that she was a mandatory reporter. But rather than worry about that, he seemed happy to have someone else besides him bringing up concerns about the living situation. I was just going to say, I'm not blaming or anything like that, but just curious why you're talking to the parents that the kid is voicing concern about instead of just calling it in. Well, I don't. I, I definitely think there was more to the story on why she was so adamant it wasn't David because she was used to seeing kids who are being hurt by boyfriends or like random right. no, men. No, I get that. Like I've had this kid a million times. So I get where they like suddenly are sleeping all day and they're suddenly acting right. different and they can only sleep at school because it's the only safe space. Like I get all that. So I'm wondering why, like, you know that shit. So that's when you call. So I'm just wondering why. Yeah, she, I don't know. I think. And again, not a blame, just more of a curiosity. I think they were pretty close. Like she clearly was tracking the behavior. Mm -hmm. so she kept very, very detailed notes about okay. everything this kid was saying and doing. And it lined up exactly with the schedule. So I think she was likely just reaching out because she had concerns about the mother right. and the mother situation. But yes, agreed. It's almost, it is odd that she would talk just to better either off of them. Call, I've you call on everything because it's better to be calling and be wrong right. than to not call and be wrong. That's all. Daylin Zoller called DHS in November of 2004 to report the troubling signs of abuse she saw with Carly. 
A few days later, the Department of Human Services started an investigation on Carly Sheehan. They noted that she had been acting strange, her hair was falling out, and that she had unexplained bruises. Carly's parents took her to the doctor on several occasions to look into why Carly's health was deteriorating. Her doctor said it was stress. She's pulling out her hair as a way to cope with the stress of mom having a new boyfriend. Perhaps the irregular schedule with her parents was enough to incite the nervous tics. The bruises? Well, those are just everyday kid injuries from playing. A few days after the call, DHS caseworker Matt Stark was assigned the assessment for the possible physical abuse of Carla Sheehan. He immediately spoke to the woman who reported it and received her detailed notes on the family. He was also told by her that the parents had made a doctor appointment for the child based on her suggestion. After receiving plenty of information from Daylin, Stark reached out to a contact in the police department who worked abuse cases, Detective Karen Stodder. He also called Dr. Carol Shevernack, the medical director for the Child Victim Assessment Center. Now, while he consulted with her, he did not ask her to see Carly. Standard procedure would be that if there was suspected abuse, she would be seen by the doctor, particularly this doctor. However, since Stark knew the parents had an appointment with their doctor, he made an exception and assumed it would suffice. Huge mistake. At the doctor appointment, Matt Stark surprised David and Sarah Sheehan. During the examination, Stark inquired with the parents on additional details. He asked Sarah if Carly was ever left alone with her new boyfriend, Sean, and she told him no. Stark also wanted to speak with Carly when her parents were not around, hoping he could get additional information. This proved incredibly difficult for him because she constantly cried for her father. The appointment ended with a few blood tests to rule out anything serious, and Matt Stark saying that the DHS investigation would continue. So while there was no definitive, yes, this child is being abused, there was certainly not enough information to close the case. David took Carly to her doctor again to discuss some strange occurrences he witnessed with his daughter. One day when she was frustrated, she started hitting herself and pulling at her hair. He called Matt Stark, who suggested he take her back to the doctor, who explained it was likely continued stress and anxiety. No escalation to a doctor with child abuse training. And I will say this. Witnessing that may have really swayed Carly's father to be less suspicious of his ex-wife and her boyfriend. Oh, because she was hitting herself that he... Right. She was upset and basically <sighs> saying, I'm dumb, hitting herself and pulling out her hair. So then he's starting to say, okay, all of oh, this... Oh, she's hitting herself. Right. Is... All of this behavior my wife is tell my ex-wife is telling me she's doing, she is actually doing. So Instead maybe the saying, doctor's right. Holy crap, that's not a normal natural behavior, behavior that I, I'm expecting from first a First time father, he doesn't know. A major alarm bell for me is that at some point, it looks like Stark had actually uncovered that Sean Fields had a record. He had a history of domestic abuse against his former wife. And yet, even knowing that information, he still appeared to keep this case to himself and allow the family to take Carly to her personal pediatrician. Knowing that there's a new male figure in Carly's life with an abusive past was not enough for him to turn this case over to Dr. Shevernak. What came from all of these visits and DHS investigations was that Sarah promised David, the doctor, DHS, that she would limit Carly's time with her boyfriend and that she had never and would never leave Carly alone with him. Perhaps if Carly got back on her regular schedule with just mom and just dad, things would go back to normal and Carly's stress and anxiety would lessen. But then there was a shift. David Sheehan suddenly found himself under investigation for child abuse. It seems Matt Stark had his eyes trained on dad. He brought him into his office where David thought he was going to be discussing Sarah and her new boyfriend and ends up being told they were investigating him. He spends the next hour defending himself, writing on a whiteboard, recounting his timeline of his travels. He answered question after question. David was now not only fearing for the health and safety of his child, but he's worried about his own safety. He was petrified he was going to get deported and forever be away from his daughter. And now again, Matt Stark is suggesting there is grounds for abuse, saying the father might have done it, 
yet he does not ask the doctor to review Carly. This guy sucks. Sure does. At this point in the investigation, Sarah has completely moved in with Sean Field. She was paying his rent and bringing her toddler into this environment, an environment that Carly was clearly not comfortable with. While Sarah is adamant with DHS that no one was abusing Carly, not her boyfriend and not, ch- not the father, she claims that the child's stress is leading her s- to hit herself. So even knowing that, wouldn't you want to keep her away from him? Yeah, you'd think so. So now, even though she's saying there's no abuse, she's now keeping a diary. And in this diary, she is reporting the things Carly does when she pulls out her hair. And every time she mentions that her daddy is hurting her. Very suspicious. How interesting, too, that as the investigation starts, she's suddenly keeping a diary and suddenly documenting all of these things. Almost like it was a planned planned alibi or something. I know. It's odd. Not long after they told David Sheehan that he was suspected of abuse, Detective Karen Sauter and Matt Stark closed the case. On December 7, 2004, they noted that the case was unfounded for abuse and attributed the child's injuries to the doctor's suggestion that the living situation induced stress and that the abuse was actually self-inflicted. And again, let's point out that at no point during the investigation Did a doctor who was trained in child abuse assessment ever see this child? On December 11th, Carly was delivered to David looking very bad. This was her week to be with her father. And in a normal week, they would exchange her at a local coffee shop, somewhere public. But this time, Sarah drove Carly to David's house. And this is not something she ever did. When they arrived, David was shocked. The child before him had a swollen eye, a scratched face, and hardly any hair at all. He took his daughter into his arms and held her while he considered what was he going to do. He now had no question in his mind that Sarah's boyfriend was hurting his daughter. This was clearly not self-inflicted. And he ended up taking photos of Carly that night to document exactly how she looked when she was delivered to him. He even brought her over to a friend's home to show them. He wanted a witness to see what she had looked like after he had just received her from her mother. And then he picked up the phone and called 911. After David was able to get a frantic Carly to sleep, he called Matt Stark to file a DHS report. He left him a voicemail as Stark didn't pick up because he was on vacation. And little did David know that someone who had been at his friend's house, someone he wasn't friends with, was a mandatory reporter who had called the police. That night, the police came to David's front door. He explained the situation that his daughter had been delivered to him from his ex Sarah in that condition. He took photos and the officer ended up leaving and telling him he was going to go to the ex's house to double check the story. How, if you're under investigation, and it's been implied that you've abused your child, how do you not, I mean, like, not even move and just call nine, again, I'm not trying to victim blame. I'm just saying, like, that's wild to me that you wouldn't go, holy crap, I'm not moving, and you're not moving until the cops get here and we're having a conversation. Yeah, I mean, we're all different people, obviously. If it were me, I wouldn't have let her leave. I would have yeah, kept my exactly. ex there and called the police exactly. right then. Exactly. That's exactly what I would have done. Anyway. So. But ev- everyone in this story made missteps, which you'll right. soon learn. The police officer then drove straight over to Sean and Sarah's in the middle of the night, and he did find that the story was corroborated. They told him that the injuries were self-inflicted and that she had been seen by a doctor and diagnosed with these stress issues. The officer did file a report, which would eventually go back to Karen's daughter, the detective. And again, mistakes were made. No one other than Carly's dad took photos of Carly that night. The abuse report of Carly Sheehan would now go to someone new because Matt Stark was out of office. Elizabeth Castillo was the one to finally review the officer's report from the late night visit to David's home. She met with David, who explained the entire story to her that he had previously told the officer. From David's perspective, the woman walked in assuming he was abusing his daughter. She made some remarks about how some Catholic fathers punished their kids by pulling hair. He was taken aback. He tried to keep his cool, and he told her that he had taken photos of Carly when the mother had dropped her off, and he was happy to share them with her. 
She declined. Instead, she wanted to take her own photos, which makes sense to me. But let me remind you, bruises heal. Any photo that this woman would have taken would look very different from when Carly was delivered to David. David did end up passing his photos to DHS, but lo and behold, they went missing and were noted as either lost or stolen. And when they finally went to court, David had to actually submit the photos since nobody else had them. While the case has now been reopened, Carly is still seeing her own pediatrician, but now she has an appointment with a counselor, an appointment made by her mother when DHS instructed her to do so. Sarah told the counselor that Carly's behavior started when she moved in with her new boyfriend, and after a single session, one where her mother did the talking, Carly had been diagnosed with acute anxiety and depression, things that could possibly lead to a child hurting herself. Yet again, not confirmed abuse and no doctor with child abuse assessment training. David repeatedly witnessed his daughter being uncomfortable with the idea that she'd have to go back to Sean Field's home. Over time, he could even see his daughter pulling away from her mother. And it wasn't just him that witnessed it. Other family members were picking up on a fracture between mother and daughter. On a family trip to her grandmother's funeral in California, Sarah's family saw her scream at the crying toddler, telling her to shut her mouth and that she didn't want to hear her. The family overheard Sarah telling anyone who would listen that David didn't have much to do with his daughter and that she was basically a single mother doing it all. But anyone who knew them knew this was a lie. David paid for everything, all of her childcare. He doted on her. He was pretty much her only real caretaker, even as an infant. In Carly's file from when she was delivered, the nurses noted that David was the primary caretaker and that he was the one that took her to newborn classes. Sarah wanted nothing to do with it. Sarah was described by her own family members as lacking an emotional attachment to her own child. The co-parenting between David and Sarah was more tenuous than ever. When David would bring up Carly's new injuries to Sarah to inquire about them, the conversation would turn from regular everyday bumps and bruises to a very argumentative situation where Sarah would suggest that she's going to start taking photos of Carly when David returned her so that she could use them to get full custody of their child. In May 2005, Carly spent time with her maternal grandparents in Eastern Oregon. Her grandmother noted that she had weird scratches in her armpits and that the young girl cried for her father constantly. When her grandmother inquired about her parents and their significant others, Carly got very upset when discussing Sean. I believe she called him poopy and that when her grandmother asked if she was spanked by him, she would just have like a long pause say no and then like run away clearly avoiding any kind of conversation about him after the visit her grandparents took carly back to david and the conversation turned to the topic of david moving he told them that he planned to take carly with him and move to portland and this was planned for august of that summer but what he didn't know was that in less than a month his daughter would be dead The night of June 2nd, 2005, Carly was spending the night with Sean Fields and his nine-year-old daughter. Sarah was working, then golfing, then partying. In fact, she was noted as actually been caught by a police officer in the parking lot of her work doing a little bit of something-something with a local fella. Ah. When she got home, Sean blocked her from entering the room where Carly slept. He said that she was finally sleeping, that she had terrible allergies that day, and that she really should just leave her alone to get some sleep. He then mentioned that Carly had also hurt herself a little bit jumping off of a bed that night. Sarah did not force her way in. Instead, she waited to check on her till later that morning. On the morning of Friday, June 3rd, Sarah thought Carly was in a depressed mood and it was possibly due to a pain in her eye, which was swollen shut. She called her father and inquired about you know, what allergies could do, if your eyes could swell shut. And by how she was describing the the issue with her eyes, the father said, give her some Benadryl and she'll probably be fine. Now, while Sarah worried about Carly's eye, she also tried to figure out if there was more wrong with her since she was acting so sullen and depressed. 
She tried to get her to use her toys to kind of act out what was wrong. And she claims that Carly spoke in a soft voice and said that she wanted to go be with Jesus. This, of course, is on the word of Sarah, otherwise known as hearsay, as there are no witnesses that can corroborate this. But what we do know is that the child did not get medical care and her mother went to work at 11.20 a.m., leaving the child with Sean. A few hours later, Sarah Sheehan is on her way home from work, calls Sean to mention that she's going to stop and pick up a treat for Carly. He insists that she does not stop, come straight home, and when she does, she finds Carly dead on the floor of her boyfriend's apartment. This is between 1 and 2 p.m. A call was made to 911 that day at 1.53 p.m., and it was Sarah on the line calling for help for her daughter who lay on the floor, not breathing. The call is described as frantic and Sarah was screaming. In the recording, Sarah can be heard begging for Carly to come back to her over and over. Police and EMTs arrived at the house around 2 p.m. and found Carly unresponsive. While there, at least one paramedic overheard Sean tell Sarah not to talk to paramedics and not to talk to police. The EMTs rushed Carly to Good Samaritan Regional Medical Center, and the staff attempted to revive her without success, and she was pronounced dead at 2.40 p.m. After Carly was taken to the hospital, police worked to get a warrant for the home. I can only describe the scene at the field residence as very odd. Sean remained on site, shuffling around things in the room as police were there investigating. He's muttering to police that what he did in his room would ruin his life. Now, my thought, of course, goes straight to Carly. What did he do to her in that room? But what they discovered was that he had marijuana plants in his room. To Sean Fields, his life was over not because there was a dead three-year-old on the floor of his house, but because he was growing drugs. Sean Field was arrested for the manufacturing of marijuana and taken into custody while Carly's family was notified that she was dead. Doctors spoke to Sarah about her daughter's injuries, and the mother basically told them she had really bad allergies and had been rubbing at her eye. What she didn't know is the eye was completely ruptured, which is something that cannot happen from allergies. She had a head injury. She told the doctor she had jumped off the bed and hit her head. She didn't witness it, but her boyfriend had told her that. But the doctor said that he had never seen such bad head injuries in a child, basically saying it couldn't be worse if you fell on your head from a two-story window. David Sheehan didn't know that the last words he would ever hear from his beloved daughter were recorded on his cell phone that day. That morning, Sarah had called David so Carly could talk to him. Getting his voicemail, Carly spoke into the phone and said, Hi, Daddy, I miss you and I love you. His life changed forever in the next phone call he got from Carly's grandfather, Gene Brill. At 2.45, Gene called David to let him know that Carly was in the emergency room. David, who was in Hillsboro at the time, got in his car and started the drive to Corvallis. This drive would take a little bit over an hour. And by the time he was nearly halfway, he received a phone call from a doctor at the hospital and was informed that his daughter arrived in the ER not breathing and that they were unable to revive her and that she had passed. When he finally arrived at the hospital... Police questioned him about his whereabouts and asked him to give a DNA sample. And they took a DNA sample from a swab in his penis, a very ominous sign. The autopsy of Carly Sheehan painted a picture of severe abuse. She had more than 60 visible external injuries on her body and 20 more that were not visible. Some of these bruises were on her feet and head. When she had been taken to the ER the day of her death, one of the doctors reported that she had bruising and dilation of her vagina, which can be an indication of sexual trauma. However, in autopsy, sexual abuse was inconclusive, so that was not something that would ever be pursued as a charge against her attacker. No semen had been found on Carly that day. However, when the home was investigated, they did find semen on the carpet of the children's bedroom. David Sheehan point blank asked the examiner if his daughter had been sexually abused, but without conclusive results, they told him she had not. But if you ask people who know this case in Corvallis, you will get a very different answer. 
Sean Field was finally going to be held accountable for more than manufacturing drugs. He was arrested on 23 counts of murder, abuse, and endangering the welfare of a minor. So let's talk motive. What reason did Sean Fields have to abuse a three-year-old child? Prosecution argued that it all boiled down to money. At some point, he had actually seen David's tax return, and he knew that David made a very good living and he wanted a piece of it. Him and Sarah have been described by many as money-obsessed and lazy, the kind of people who didn't want to work hard for money but wanted to have a lot of it. Field's goal was to abuse Carly and make it look like her father did it. Then Sarah could get full custody and a big monthly child support payment from David. What was presented to the jury was that Fields used Sarah Brill to support this story by lying to the police and pointing the finger at David, as well as helping him detail the abuse in photos and in her diary, and regularly pointing out that Carly was blaming her dad for the bruises and hair pulling. I also don't know that you need a motive when it comes to attacking children. I think that's such a level of, not that motives are an excuse, but it's like, you're, it is. you're a child abuser. I get it. Is yeah, what I think... you are. So I doubt that you went through like, I know how to get money. I'll just beat the crap out of your kid. It's like, no, you're a child abuser and they needed something to lock you away. Like, I think it's definitely just like a tradition of court that every crime has to right, have a motive. Right. And in this case, they determined it started out with financial gain, but turned into something he right. enjoyed. What also came out was that Fields was hiding a homosexual lifestyle and that for some reason he feared Carly would talk about it. Now, they pulled records that he had many friends on a website called gay.com. This is where he would line up sexual encounters. So maybe he had them over to the house when Carly was present since she wasn't going to school like his older daughter. But I'm not quite sure how a three-year-old would out a grown man. I lean to this being more of a factor of the type of person he is rather than any kind of motive for abusing a child. Yeah, he's a liar. Exactly. He's secretive. He, he has was, multiple right. lives. Yeah. He's hiding who he was, which can lead to anger, frustration, and perhaps violent outbursts. And we know that that means he's a piece of shit. <laughs> Sean Field was also described as severely controlling. It was up to him what people in his life did on a daily basis. He would become outraged with anger that was entirely uncontrollable, and it would be over anything. Sarah noted that he had strict rules at home like people couldn't sit on his couch, including Carly. She was not allowed to sit on his couch. He determined what they showed on TV, ESPN only. He assumed that when he went to bed, Everyone had to go to bed. There was also the history of domestic violence against his ex-wife, the mother of his child. Sean and Eileen had been married for 10 years, divorcing in 2002. Eileen testified in court to the abuse she had suffered at the hands of her husband, as well as the animal abuse she witnessed him inflict. She had also been the primary focus of his abuse. She had been strangled, smothered, and even kicked down a flight of stairs. Prosecution did not pursue Sarah Sheehan. Instead, they said they needed her to build a case against Sean. Sarah admitted in court that the diary she kept detailing David's abusive behavior against their daughter was fake. It was entirely made up, but that she did it under Sean's direction. Sarah noted that there were times when Sean would even give her sleeping pills, making it very unlikely that she would hear anything around her or wake up. And then in court, she made a point to address Sean and say she was angry at God because God had let him into their lives only so that he could take the life of her daughter away. Now, I realize that many victims of domestic abuse fail to protect their own children, that they're so distraught over their own abuse that they maybe are making decisions they wouldn't otherwise or they're just too scared to do anything. We also know that Sean has a history of abuse, but I will say this. They were not married. They had only been together a few months. And the entire time she lived with this man, she ke she kept another apartment. She paid for an apartment where she had a roommate. So this was not a woman who had nowhere to go. And this wasn't a secret. I mean, you've got an open DHS investigation. You've got an ex-husband saying, I'm taking pictures. I'm doing all this stuff. Like, everything is in front of you. It's not a, 
the fact that she was defending it but not in denial you know the denial part's yeah. one thing with the de- with abuse like that where it's no it wouldn't be and that would make sense but yeah you've got an apartment you've been together two minutes and you could just take space like- and there was a point in time there was a break between the fall and the spring where she did back off from hanging out with him a lot and carly appeared to be doing a little better so why wouldn't you why just go back yeah it's and so again, odd it's to me. not to say this is her fault for well, I actually do think it is. So I I, th- I think she has responsibility in it. I'm I'm going to say this. On this case, I do not think she can hide behind abuse. There is no record there of, anything her, of her being abused. No, there is okay. no record of her being hit. He was controlling. He was demanding. But like I said, she was making her own money, paying for his apartment. She was the breadwinner. Right. She was not relying on him for anything. And... This was someone she had found gay porn on his computer. Like, I'm very confused as to why she would stay with a boyfriend that she had only been with a few months when she knows her daughter is being hurt. Right, for your child's protection. And even if she did want to stay, she should have known David would have taken full custody in a heartbeat if she said, you keep her. He... He was a loving father. I think it speaks a lot to her emotional detachment disorders to not make that connection or to be, be like no i'm gonna be with this guy because we're in this i would assume based on what i've heard like it was probably a pretty intense and toxic and they probably had like you know that wild chemistry that yeah it was very get. sexual and so, so it's even, like i even read that the the morning that she found car or the day she found carly dead she had sex with him before she even checked on her so like I, I'm just baffled by this woman. Yeah. I'm baffled. And while I think many people who are victims of abuse, I can understand why you didn't step in between yeah, a man you and your child. And why, yeah. I can't with this one. I absolutely think she had major fault in this case. Yeah. There were 18 witnesses called in the trial of Sean Wesley Field, one of which was his own daughter, Caitlin. Now, this is a hard one. This young girl was the only other person present the night before Carly's death. She was petrified to be on the stand and even asked if she could wear a wig and sunglasses, which obviously she could not, but she powered through it. She stepped on that stand and she spoke about what her father did or what she assumed he had done. Caitlin detailed how she went to bed that night and Carly did not go with her. Instead, Carly was in her dad's room. She could hear crying and she could hear Carly making sounds. And she could also hear what she described as spoon spanking, the sound of Carly being hit with a wooden spoon, something that this child knew the sound of. The eye injury that Sarah Brill found on her daughter the morning of her death was noted by experts to be consistent with having been hit by a wooden spoon. Broken wooden spoons were indeed found in the garbage of the field residence. Both Carly's and Sean's DNA were found on those spoons. Prosecution described to the jury that Sean Field killed Carly after two separate sessions of abuse. Field sealed his own fate and proved this to be true with his own desire to try to pin the abuse on Carly's father. Carly was in Sean's care while her mother was out golfing with her friends, something she did every week. I think it was every Wednesday she went golfing with them. Now, after he had spent the day abusing Carly, he stopped to take pictures, instructing her to smile for the camera. Now, get this. The photos prove the exact time he took the picture. This is a time that he was known to be alone with her. In the photos, she is looking at the camera. Her eyes are focused. And while she was clearly under distress, she had been crying. She is cognizant because her eyes are focused on the lens. Now, that timestamp is 1.22 p.m. Now, had the beating stopped there, all the experts think she would have been alive. But what happened was that it continued. The medical examiner and the forensic pathologist noted that the head trauma that killed her would have happened less than an hour after she was struck. So right there, Sean himself proves that he was the only one who could have done this to the child. So ultimately what's proven in court is that he beat Carly, strangling her, evidence of which was found on her neck in the form of redness, like something being wrapped around it, as well as tearing on the inside of her upper lip, which was consistent with being smothered by a pillow. While some of that trauma could have caused deprivation of 
of blood and oxygen to her brain, it would not have killed her. He then stopped, documented her injuries so that he could eventually try to pin it on her father, and then he later goes back to beat her, ultimately inflicting a killing blow, blunt force trauma to her head, which would have caused her death in a very short time period. Field was found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of Carly Sheehan's death, and I'm going to read from the sentencing memorandum in the court documents. On November 3rd, 2006, the jury returned verdicts indicating that they found beyond a reasonable doubt that Sean Wesley Field killed Carly Sheehan. Further, the jury found beyond reasonable doubt that the defendant had assaulted her, shown extreme indifference for the value of human life, used a dangerous weapon in assaulting Carly, withheld medical attention, and most significantly tortured her. Evidence showed that the defendant began with a financial motive, but that the jury found the defendant progressed to the point where he was intentionally inflicting intense physical pain as a separate objective part apart from any other purpose. The counts he was found guilty of are as follows. Three counts aggravated murder, one count murder, two counts felony murder, three counts murder by abuse, four counts manslaughter one, one count of manufacture and delivery of a controlled substance within a thousand feet of a school, two counts endangering the welfare of a minor. It was now up to a judge to determine if he would be sentenced to concurrent or consecutive sentences and if he would ever see parole. While the defense asked the court to give him concurrent sentences, Judge Holcomb announced that the assault would be counted as separate and distinct criminal acts, which meant consecutive sentences. I'm super impressed with this judge, by the way. The judge then sentenced him to 46 years and five months in prison, and thanks to Measure 11, which sets a mandatory sentence for serious crimes, he would never be eligible for parole. But whether or not he'd be eligible for parole was moot because in 2015, Sean Field died in prison. Field had been living with both cancer and AIDS, something he had contracted prior to going to prison. And I say, good riddance. Sarah Brill continued to have controversy follow her. Like me, many are unsatisfied with the state not pursuing charges against her for the death of her daughter, who died as a result of her continued insufficient parenting, allowing her three-year-old daughter to be left alone in the care of a boyfriend who she describes herself as controlling, angry, and abusive. And after finding gay porn on his computer, she actively searched to see if there was a trace of child porn. But she still left her daughter alone with him. Now, for me, I would think she had an idea she was going to find it if she went looking for it. If that even crosses your mind, why are you why? leaving your kid with him? Exactly. Carly's Angels was dreamt up by Sarah Brill. In fact, she won a magazine award for her efforts with it. Glamour magazine bestowed Sarah with Reader of the Year for her essay about her work with Carly's Angels. They flew her to a party where she met and was photographed with celebrities like Uma Thurman. Karen Spears Zacharias wrote to the magazine on behalf of David to ensure they were aware of who they were rewarding, a woman who many suspected leveraged her daughter's death to form the illusion of a nonprofit that would benefit people like Carly, when in fact it was likely to pad her own pocket. And as far as I know, that charity didn't last long. It no longer exists. And Sarah has a new name now. And if I had it, I would tell it to you because I absolutely believe she's at <laughs> fault here. After Carly's death, David Sheehan has worked to find ways to help other children. In cases like this, restitution is often made to the victim's family. David created a children's advocacy foundation in Carly's name for these payments. He's a huge supporter of the ABC House, an abuse intervention center in Albany, Oregon. His stance is that if a center like that had intervened with Carly, today would be a very different situation for him. He raised funds to put in a new playground at Avery Park in Corvallis and dedicated it to the memory of Carly. I visited Carly's grave and the playground this past weekend and was incredibly moved. I stood there trying to, just a fraction of me, trying to understand what it was he could possibly feel each day. And while I have sadness and tears and anger and outrage over her death, 
I can never understand the anguish that he feels when he thinks about the memories he has or the dreams he had for her that she'll never reach. I commend him on his efforts to make things better for other children. Nothing can bring Carly back, but perhaps the efforts he has put forth could stop it from happening to someone else. David has since remarried and has started a new chapter in his life, but he does continue to give interviews and talk about what happened to Carly as an effort to educate and incite change. Progress was born from this utterly tragic event, and that is Carly's Law. Carly's Law was enacted in 2007, and what it does for Oregon is ensure that a child will receive medical attention by doctors trained in abuse within 48 hours of a suspicious injury during a child abuse investigation. Now, this might not sound like a whole lot, but if we think back to Carly, DHS was called by her babysitter who knew something wasn't right. An investigation ensued, and she was only ever reviewed by her personal doctor, who was not, who might have been a great doctor, but was not formally trained in abuse. Now, had Carly been seen by a doctor who was trained in abuse within 48 hours of the injuries, I wholeheartedly think we would have a different outcome today. Carly's Law was brought to the Oregon House of Representatives and was sponsored by Sarah Gelzer. Now, it doesn't happen often, but the House unanimously voted for this bill to be passed. So I guess it's small wins, even though it feels a little bit too late because a loss of one child to abuse is one too many. But thanks to Carly, thousands of children have been impacted by this bill. After the law passed, the number of children assessed for abuse rose 140%. Now, that doesn't mean there's a rise in child abuse. It just means more abuse allegations were investigated by trained They're professionals. They're actually being seen. Exactly. Rather than just dismissing it because some person says, oh, a doctor saw her, you're actually following the rules and making sure that if it's suspicious, somebody with training sees them. Hey Alicia, have you given much thought to home security? I mean, we do host a true crime podcast. It would be nice to have peace of mind, but it just seems like something that doesn't fit my lifestyle. That's what I thought too, but then I found Simply Safe. So let's play a game. You tell me all of the reasons why you don't have a home security system, and I'll blow your mind with some reasons why Simply Safe is a good option for you. Yay, a game! Okay, uh, number one, cost. You know, I'm very thrifty, and home security just screams expensive. Simply Safe has tons of packages, so everyone can stay safe on a budget. You can cover just your front door or get sensors on every window and cameras in every room. But for 24 hour coverage, it starts at just $15 a month. Okay, well, paying some stranger to come set up a security system for me in my house during a pandemic doesn't really sound that appealing. Honestly, I'm a little surprised you wouldn't welcome a guy in uniform into your house, but not to worry, it's totally DIY. I set up my own system in 20 minutes. But if for some reason you need help, they have someone you can call. Okay, Smarty, how about for those of us, as example, you and I, who are renters, we can't even paint a wall without permission. How do you expect us to install a huge security system into our homes without damage? That was my biggest concern as well, since I'm a renter. But you don't have to put holes in your wall for Simply Safe. All of their sensors use 3M strips so you don't damage the paint. Even if you move, you can take your system with you. You do love a good command strip. Well, I guess that covers all of my concerns, but I'm sure there are other systems out there too. Why Simply Safe? Well, you mean besides the thousands of real customer reviews and myself telling you it's great? Well, US News and World Report named it the best overall home security of 2020. Why not take a little bit of stress out of your very stressful life and invest in your own safety and security? Check out Simply Safe today. Murder in the Rain listeners who sign up with Simply Safe get a free HD camera. Dude, free stuff. Okay, okay. I'm going to check it out by going to simplysafe.com and using the promo code slash rain, which is what you, dear listeners, should do to receive a free HD camera. That's simplysafe.com slash rain. Karen Spears Zacharias is an author and just so happens to be someone who is very close to the Sheehan family. When she heard of Carly's murder, she reached out to David to get his blessing to write a book about what happened and to share Carly's story. I got the chance to speak to Karen about her book, A Silence of Mockingbirds, and her experience with the Sheehan family. 
Okay, so your book on the Carly Sheehan case comes from a really interesting perspective and one that I find that is pretty uncommon in true crime books, and that's from someone who actually knew the family. Why don't we get started just letting our listeners know a bit about your history with Sarah Brill? Sure. So uh, we were living in Pendleton at the time, raising our own four children, and my husband was a teacher, and I was a substitute teacher, something I've done off and on for many years. I've taught at the university level, but I've always kept my foot in the door in the high school teaching because I just enjoyed that age group. And I was substitute teaching at a small place outside of Pendleton called Helix, Oregon. And uh, there was this girl I had in class. She was, I think about 14 at the time, and she was incredibly attractive. Uh, She was mulatto or mixed race, which uh, was something you didn't run into very often in Eastern Oregon, because it is primarily, I think at the time I was living in Pendleton, our African-American community was under five percent maybe as low as one percent it was pretty significant i grew up in georgia during the time of civil rights and integration and all of that so it was quite a different demographic Mm -hmm. uh, for me and so i was just naturally attracted to her she was uh, very talkative in class so it was hard to ignore The reason she was going to school out in Helix is because she had already been in trouble uh, in various uh, classrooms in the Pendleton area. I knew Sarah's parents because her mom was a teacher as well, special ed teacher up at the junior high. And I shortly thereafter began working at the newspaper and became a columnist and reporter for the newspaper there. So I was pretty, if I didn't know them, people knew me. Right. (laughs) um, Because of the high profile nature of the job. Sarah would come by to talk about um, boyfriend trouble or a lot of times she came by to talk about her relationship with her mother, which was very strained. Mm. Sarah, I knew Sarah was adopted. It, I knew growing up in the South, uh, the issues that African American children face when thrown into a white populace. I knew that it couldn't be easy for Sarah to be, not know her who her parents were, not know where she was from. So, did you feel like you took on kind of a motherly role with her? Definitely. She referred to herself and I referred to her as, you know, the other daughter. I had three daughters. They absolutely adored Sarah. She was part of the family and we embraced her. When Sarah was in her freshman year of community college and she was attending the local community college, uh, Blue Mountain Community College, Sarah got pregnant and she was 18 or 19 at the time, but she came to us when she was pregnant. She asked us to adopt that baby. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. You know, Sarah's pregnant. She was adopted. Her parents live in town. You know, I said, well, look, we need some parameters if we're going to adopt this baby then we need to have Carol and Jean's blessing on this because, you know, if I were a grandmother and I were running into my grandchild around town all the time, but Mm -hmm. grandchild didn't know I was the grandmother, it was just too complicated. Right. So what we did was we set up a parameter with Sarah that said, okay, Sarah, we're willing to do this, but First, we need the blessing of your parents. 
well she just didn't understand that at all she just you know thought that was ridiculous but she agreed to it and, and carol and jean uh, naturally uh were opposed to it and i don't think they were opposed to it at all because of who tim and i were but, but seeing, seeing your grandchild being yeah, raised by other just people. seeing your grandchild i introduced sarah to a mutual well to a girlfriend's mutual friend that kind of thing who she had a large family too but she wanted to adopt and that is what sarah ended up doing was adopting that baby out to this mutual friend's baby uh, family it was following that birth and that whole scenario that sarah came to live with us because there was crisis after the baby was born. And how do you think that impacted her having been adopted and then giving up a baby for adoption? Do you think it affected her pretty strongly? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely think that it was um, one of the hardest decisions she's ever had to make. At the time, the big crisis was that I had, she had called me when she went into labor her parents had put her with her agreement, I think, into a home for unwed mothers, which I thought was just absurd. Sarah was 19 years old. Wow. Uh, who goes into a home for unwed mothers? Like, I mean, that was, seemed, you know, granted this was the late 90s, early. It feels uh, much older though, like the yes. 50s or 60s. <laughs> yes, it was very archaic to me, very archaic. I did not agree with it. I didn't like it. I did go visit her. It was up in Tacoma. I just thought it was the most absurd thing I had ever heard of. Like, there is no shame, no reason to hide this. Sarah knew that I had gotten pregnant when I was a senior in high school and I had had an abortion. And so we kind of had that bond in all of that. Mm -hmm. And so when she went into labor, she called me and said, I want you to come. Well, I asked her, is your mom there? And she said, yes. And then I asked her if the adopted mom was there and she said, yes. Well, I really, truly wanted to go, but I didn't think I belonged there. And it was a hard thing for me emotionally to not be there because I had always been there for Sarah. Mm -hmm. We had a, a very tight relationship. She was very angry that I wouldn't come. And I just, I felt like, what, what would I do? I would be there for emotional support for Sarah, which I, suppose was valuable but i felt like i would be a threat to her mom and to the adoptive mom that was i don't know if it was the right decision it felt like the right thing to do at that time but that's what i did mm -hmm. i didn't go and then about three days later when she's checking out the hospital the adoptive mom calls me and she's hysterical because Sarah doesn't want to let the baby go. Mm. And I thought she'd be a good mom. What happened was she ended up going home with that adoptive family and staying with them. Oh, because she wasn't sure about it or? Yes, because she okay. wasn't. So she ended up going to home with them with the baby and staying there for about six, I don't know. I can't remember how long it was. A, it was a time period, maybe six weeks. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that Carol's feelings were hurt mm -hmm. that I seemed to have a close relationship with Sarah that she didn't have. And of course, it's easy for me to have done that. I was not her mother. Right. <laughs> I, I did raise three girls. I know, I know the process. <laughs> they let her stay until she felt comfortable leaving the baby. That was generous of them, but it was also, I mean, uh they're in it for themselves too right right like it, there's a um i was reading a scottish philosopher this week adam smith and he talked about how 
we have concern for other people, but oftentimes our concern for other people is based in what's best for us. <laughs> That's <laughs> <It's>, true. <laughs> that it is true. true. It's human nature. And no condemnation at all about that. But they had a vested interest to be kind to Sarah. They had a vested interest in inviting her into their home. Um, they wanted to adopt that baby. So when she finally decided to leave and, and give up her baby to them, was it a clean break? Did she just leave or was she still in contact? She was still in contact. It was not a clean break. And there was lots of tears. This was a very emotional time. And Sarah was at crosshairs with everything in her life at that point. And so Tim and I talked, my husband and I, and we just, I said, Sarah, look, just come live with us. You don't have to go back home. You can come stay here. And, um, you know, we have a bedroom for you. You can come here. You can be part of the family until you decide what it is you want to do. And so that is what happened. The baby went with the adopted couple and we kind of adopted the mother. <laughs> so um, Sarah came and lived with us. She was, she was with us quite a while, which we loved. I mean, she'd been part of the family for a while. She was going to college up at uh, the community college. She had a part-time job, but she began seeing somebody at that time they were just building the Umatilla Reservations Casino. Mm -hmm. And um, that was big news in Eastern Oregon at that time and throughout the state, of course, because what you saw politically happening was a power shift going from, you know, the state old white men to the tribe. Right. Which was, so I was very busy at work on that. When she started dating somebody from there, I just began seeing things that I was not comfortable with. I noticed this guy that she was dating from the tribe. He wasn't from Eastern Oregon. Not the kind of guy that I would have thought Sarah would have dated. Um, to say it was homely would not be a stretch. <laughs> So, so clearly she had her reasons for dating him then. Yes, and it had <laughs> nothing to do with being attracted to him. It had everything to do with his bank account. I see. I started seeing this as a pattern, not only with him, but with several others. I became concerned about it. Um, did you talk I to her did, about that? Yeah, we did, but in a gentle way way not sure. in a barbarian way just so how how long did she stay with you you know it's hard for me to remember but I think it was I'm I want to say like nine months to a year I remember she was there over Christmas uh into the spring we kept talking to her about going away to college I felt like she needed to get out of Pendleton mm -hmm. and see the world see you know, Tim and I had both traveled a lot, so we wanted her to have those experiences, get out of here and find people that, she was very bright and loved to read, loved to write, so we shared those things in common. She just had a bigger personality in a quiet way, but she did eventually decide she was gonna go away to college. But it was, I don't know, a year or two later, she showed up with this guy and she was married. And oh, his, so you didn't know about him before I didn't they know, married? Ah, oh. no. So she, she shows just, up and she, says, surprise, I'm Sarah Sheehan now. Yes, <laughs> and that's exactly what she did. So I, what did you think? What, what, what was he like? Well, I mean, you know, again, we... We are the open arm kind of people, so we're like, bring him into the house. And and then she told me that she, David had been in Corvallis working for HP, and they met and developed a relationship. And at some point, she went to Ireland with him. We loved David. 
I mean, actually what I was thinking at the time is this is really good for Sarah. I felt like I knew that in my own marriage, all I had had a pretty chaotic childhood myself. Um, I knew that my marriage and the good heartedness of my husband had helped heal a lot of the hurt that I had dealt with growing up. Sure. And so that was my hope for Sarah was this is good. David yeah. is it seems David like is, maybe it could, she could get some stability and right from that. Right. Yep. Like he's focused. He he was an engineer. He made a decent salary and he was all about education and supportive of her pursuing her education. He absolutely adored her. And that was obvious. And she seemed more settled than I had seen her since I met her. And we stayed in touch from that point on. They were back in Corvallis living that life. And Sarah called to let me know that she was pregnant. And we were thrilled over that. I think she told David on Father's Day oh. mm. that, uh, you know, they were going to have a baby. And Carly was born in January, early January. And uh, we went, the girls and I made a trip down there. I think I think it was near where Carly was being christened. Uh, David was a devout Catholic, um, and I think Sarah had maybe joined the Catholic Church at that point. Anyway, we went by, saw David and Sarah, met Carly, loved it, you know, just continued our talking on occasion, uh, seeing each other when we could, that kind of thing, when she came up to see her parents. I remember this part clearly. I was driving my car and the phone rang and I answered it. It was Sarah. So I pulled into the Safeway parking lot and I did not know at that point that Sarah was in town. That was not how she approached it. She was calling and we just chit-chatted a little bit. And then she told me that uh, she and David were getting divorced. And it just did not go well for me at that point. I probably, you know, could have reacted differently, should have reacted differently. But because of the emotional chaos going on in my own life at the time, I just lost my cool with Sarah. And I mean, I knew Sarah really well by that point. I knew her like I knew my own children, which is to mm -hmm. say, I knew what her strengths were, but I also knew mm -hmm. what her weaknesses were. So for your perspective, was it her basically get, getting bored or giving up and just wanting to move on? Yeah, and, I, that, and from my perspective, it was being, yeah, I've done this, done that, I'm bored with it, and so now I'm right. to the next thing. That's within the context of the fact that, you know, I probably brought my own baggage to it, which is to say my own mother uh, became neglectful after my father's death in Vietnam because she was trying to cope with her own, you know, right. chaos. In my perspective, all I could think is David is a really terrific dad. And I didn't think Carly would be in danger, but I did absolutely feel in that moment that she would be neglected. And that terrified me. And my response to that terror was anger. David knew nothing about the argument. He knew, he didn't know. I mean, you know, my relationship with David was built on my relationship with Sarah at that time. I was really angry with Sarah because here I was, you know, on this lifelong journey trying to reconnect with the dad I had lost. Mm -hmm. And here was Sarah going to put Carly 
into a very similar situation. I just couldn't cope with it emotionally. Yeah. She's going to pursue her own selfish interests, and I'm not going to support her in that. I've seen her do that one too many times. I was trying to work through my own stuff. And sure, I thought about calling Sarah numerous times. But my life was in a gear that I had never known before. Right. So what happens when you when she comes back into your life? When do you see her? So again? that doesn't happen until 2007. In 2007, my my son was living in Bend, Oregon. My daughter, youngest daughter, was moving to Bend, Oregon. And we are uh, getting my daughter settled into her place. And we had uh, been walking in, in a neighborhood not far from where she was moving. And as we came up this slope on this particular road, there was a gal standing out in front of this house with looked like a realtor. And my daughter turns around at that point and looks straight at me and she goes, mom, it's Sarah. And I was like, really? Wow. And just the night before my son had shown me a picture of Sarah from the paper. It was a little story about St. Patty's Day and about how these gals were out at a local brewery. Their money had got burned in, in the fire pit. Oh. <laughs> Not a very lucky day, but Sarah was in the picture. So that morning, I had actually prayed while I was getting dressed for the day. And I, I had prayed and said, God, if Sarah's in town, let me run into her. Literally that afternoon, I know this sounds bizarre, but it's it's exactly how it happened. I that very afternoon I ran into her in in front of this house just a block away from where my daughter was moving up. Wow. I went up to her and said, Sarah, and she was stunned. She turned toward us and she hugs me, hugs my husband. It's like whatever animosity, whatever hurt had happened was gone. Right. In that moment, the way it would be with anybody's family member that mm -hmm. you had harsh words and then didn't really repair that. And then you don't see each other for years and then you run into each other and then you're like, I always loved you kind of thing. Right. And so it was one of those moments. And, and I invited her up to my daughter's house and she came and we were sitting around getting caught up, just talking, talking. And in my mind, I'm thinking that Carly would be five years of age and she would be with David probably for school. She's mm -hmm. probably living with David and going to school because Sarah had indicated what her current job was. And it was, again, not all that stable of a job. And she was doing that. And I said to her, so is Carly with David? Like her whole demeanor changed. My husband said he knew in that moment, but I did not. Like I didn't pick up on it. When somebody tells me they don't want to talk about something, I'm not the journalist who's going to press you. I'm the journalist that's going to wait until you're ready. But I will wait, like, however long that is. Like, if that's years, I'm okay. I'll still be here when you're ready to talk about it. So when a war widow would say to me, I really don't want to talk about something, I never press war widow. I, I felt like that would you know, be a cruel thing to do. So in that moment, when I asked Sarah, is Carly with David? She replied, no, Carly has passed and I don't want to talk about it. Were you taken back by that? Were you shocked? Yes, I was totally shocked. But like any journalist, you don't react emotionally mm -hmm. in that moment. You don't, you know, I didn't scream or anything. I felt tremendous 
sadness. I was stunned. Uh, I was, I felt an overwhelming sense of sorrow for Sarah and for David. There was a part of me that thought whatever happened, she feels guilty about it. Mm. But, you know, I've been a journalist. People die for a lot of reasons. I mean, sure. I've, I've interviewed people who've lost children to accidents and to cancer. And so I didn't have a sense of how Carly had died. I had a sense that however it happened, Sarah felt uh, a, a guilt over that. So when did you find out what actually happened? So the next morning, that night, we all went to dinner. We laughed. We carried on. We, you know, again, uh, uh, it was the training that I've had. So mm -hmm. I thought this is a great sorrow in her life. When she's ready to talk to me about it, she will. Sure. The next morning, she called me before we left town, and we had a sweet little visit, and I apologized to her for, you know, those years I had let go by and that I had blown up at her at a time when she obviously would need me. Mm -hmm. Felt like I had let her down. And I had. She, again, didn't say anything about Carly. And I said that I told her then, I'm sorry I wasn't there for you with Carly. I'm, and she just she just indicated that we would stay in touch and she was glad that we had reconnected that kind of thing and that morning we had left town to go back to our home in Hermiston and uh where we're living at the time so we're leaving town and we stop at the Starbucks in downtown Bend and I get back in the car and I say to my husband I just feel so bad for Sarah over Carly. I don't know what happened, but maybe it was a car wreck. You know, something happened. And he said it was a car wreck. Oh, so he had already looked it up. Yeah. I was like, how do you know this? He said, because your son looked it up last night. He said, uh, I don't want to tell you and you don't want to know. And I was like, Tim, look, I'm a journalist. As soon as you get me home and I'm near a computer, I'm going to Google it. And he said, well, you're not going to want to know. And I was like, I yelled at him at that point, tell me what happened. And he said, Sarah's boyfriend tortured and murdered Carly. What went through your head when he said that? Literally lost my breath. I felt like somebody had taken a baseball bat to my gut. I just couldn't believe it. I just, I was stunned. Uh, my kids had seen some reference to this, but they didn't put Carly, they didn't connect it. Right. Like, you know, they didn't put all the dots together, didn't read the story, just saw a headline or something. The first thing I did when I got home was not Google. In fact, I didn't Google the story for months. But the first thing I did was call David, told him how sorry I was. I, I had not been there and that I had not known and that Sarah and I had this fight and I had not been in touch. And, you know, how horrible he must have thought me for not loving Carly or not loving them enough to be present. Um, I asked him if he would meet with me. And we made arrangements to meet the very next day. I That Sunday I drove, or whatever the day was, I drove down to Corvallis the next day and met with David. And I knew from that point on I would tell the story. So you had decided then about writing about it? I knew I would write about it because how do you, how can you be a writer and a journalist and have this happen to someone that you considered family mm -hmm. and not write about it? Like, who else was going to write about it? Was he open to it right away when you said yes. you wanted to tell their story? He was. 
and he knew like he knew who I was and, and that I would be thorough and that I would be honest right that I would admit to my own failures as much as everybody else's I definitely when I read it I felt I could feel the little piece of guilt that everyone had, you know, like yeah. we all take it on in the world of, especially with children, it's hard not to do. And I definitely felt that, you know, you wrote, you wrote it with such care and support of them. I felt that. I, David, it, it's the same that I felt with my own story on my own dad, which was the only person who had the right to tell me not to write it or not to publish it once it was written was my mother. Mm. And I gave it to her to read and said, mom, you're the only person who has the right to tell me not to do this. And she didn't. And David cooperated throughout. Sarah, not, you know, obviously, no. What made all the difference in telling the story is that the defense attorney for Sean Field, Sarah's then boyfriend, was he turned over all of his records to me, boxes and boxes and boxes of police reports. And I mean, it was incredible that a defense attorney would give a reporter or a journalist. Yeah, I, I thought that as well. When you wrote about that, I thought, oh, that's odd. It is very, it never happens. <laughs> Let me say that. I had been a cop reporter, so it wasn't like I was unfamiliar. But it's kind of like, what, what is it Flannery O'Connor says about your ability to stomach the truth? <laughs> has nothing to do with my ability to tell it. So looking back at having written the story and learning all of the details about what happened to Carly, how did that impact you or, or change your perspective of Sarah or David or just life in general? Since you have read the book, you know that it made me far more aware uh, as a person the prevalence of child abuse in a country that uh, claims to care so much about children. Mm -hmm. For perspective here, during the course of the war in Iraq, we brought home something around 60, 700 um, fallen soldiers. Uh, in that same time period, there were like 20,000 children who died from child abuse in wow. the U.S. In that same time period. And so here is all this national news being given to these fallen soldiers, and rightly so, and to their families. But the, here were all of these children. I mean, I kept thinking, if you went to Dover and put out all those little baby caskets and covered them with little baby quilts, because the bulk of child abuse occurs to a child five and under. The perpetrator does this purposely because a child three and under can't report it, mm -hmm. can't talk about it, can't, you know, Carly was murdered when she was three years old. Was she articulate enough to talk about it? She was. Was she cognitively able to talk about it? I don't think so. Because Sean Field was cruel and uh, Sarah was complicit. He tortured her. I mean, that was the amazing thing to me is that the jury found him guilty of torture, but not enough to put him away for life. The, the thing that got me when I was reading your book is when you talk about how he even admitted that he knew what to do to a child and not have it look like abuse with the, the feet and the hair. And I just, thought that was so disgusting and premeditated and, and horrible. It was definitely, and, and for me, the horrible part of it is the diary entries that Sarah manufactured pointing the finger at David for this torture that she knew was going on. I mean, and, and just the doctors, there was no one connected to that case 
other than the um, DHS workers were the only two. Everyone else connected to that case had changed jobs within the first year after the case. Went on to do something else, including the pediatrician. I mean, I could imagine like just the, the realization that that went on under your nose. Right. And anyone, any one of them could have had the ability to stop it at some point. I think that's very hard for anyone to stomach and, and realize, you know, are we all complicit in that at that moment? I would like to say that Carly's story made a huge impact on DHS and has led to the protection of children. The shocking thing to me, the thing that impacted me as the writer, was the whole time I'm writing the Carly story, I'm looking at how the courts treat men. Misogyny works in a variety of ways. And we typically think of the damage it does to women. But misogyny also exists in a courtroom where the assumption, immediate assumption by almost everybody in that courtroom is that the mom is a better caretaker than the dad. That was the, one of the hardest things to get through your book is just the anxiety I had that David was being blamed for all of this. Yes, but that was purposeful. And mm -hmm. Sarah was complicit in that. And it's like her pediatrician said, who expects a mother to lie about these things? Mm -hmm. Well, nobody does except for people who work with child abuse all the time. People who work in child abuse, those child advocacy centers, they see moms lie all the time to protect the men they're with. Right. Or to protect themselves over their children. That's how come we lose five children a day. Five children a day in the U.S. die as a result of child abuse that we know about. Yeah, that we know about. What shocked me when the book came out were the amount of survivors of child abuse who got in touch with me. Yeah, I read your ebook, so you included some of the correspondence you had with people, yes. and I was, I was surprised by it but also I thought that was so neat that people would reach out to you and share their experience with knowing people in the case or or just their personal right. um, experience. I'll tell you one of the most shocking ones I got and as a writer you never think about this there is a person out in cyberspace that you never see that is going through the manuscript and making sure that everything is put together uh, for the publisher. One of the first uh, response I got was from that person oh, wow. on the other side, and it happened to be a male, and he wrote to tell me that he was that person taking care of the, that end of things, but he had been a victim of child abuse. Wow. And that was stunning to me. Yeah, it's it's scary prevalent. And I personally, I advocate for telling these kinds of stories, even though they're the hardest for listeners to get through because exactly. of that. Like, it, I've always felt if I don't read this or hear about this, that means so many other people aren't as, as well. So I'm sure every child abuse survivor out there wants to pick up the public and shake them and say, you think it's hard to read about? Try living this. I live mm -hmm. this. And I'm maybe, so... maybe those people are more aware and say a light bulb goes off and they're, they know what to look for now because they yes. really talk about it. Yes. I mean, that is certainly the way, you know, that's why I load that story with information on statistics mm -hmm. uh, and how Carly's law made a difference in the state because now, because children heal so quickly, you cannot wait. David provided DHS with photos of the abuse Carly was going through 
And it wasn't until Carly was dead that DHS came back and said, oh, we lost those photos. Like, we were in a digital era. David was livid. He was like, all you had to do was tell me you lost them. I could have got you new copies. Yeah, I know. I, I think somebody could have saved her right then and there. Those photos, I just... The photos alone, I mean, you can find them on the you know, Google search. Mm -hmm. um, there, I mean, she looked like a chemo patient in December of 2004 after a visit to Sean's house. He literally snatched her ball, literally. And I'm sure threatened all kinds of horrible things to her, which is why Carly couldn't tell her down what was happening. Yeah. So I'm, I mean, there's that justice of the man that did this went to jail and has since died. But I shut your book and I was so pissed that nothing happened with Sarah. And I have to ask your, percept your perception on that. What do, what do you think? Do you think the prosecution should have done something? Yes, I absolutely do. And that's not an easy thing to say. But until we start holding mothers accountable, mm -hmm. this child abuse situation is going to continue. Yeah. And they are complicit. Sarah was complicit. Sarah did lie repeatedly, even while Carly was laying on that stretcher at the hospital in Corvallis. When the investigator asked Sarah, who do you think did this? Sarah said, David, even though she knew that was an absolute lie, David had been in Portland all weekend. He hadn't seen Carly since he had dropped her off. Sarah, Sarah was even then, I don't think her protection was for Sean. Again, you know, I'll take you back to the Scottish philosopher. Her interest at that point was in protecting herself. Herself, yeah. It was always about Sarah. It is still always about Sarah. I can't tell you how many boyfriends of hers I have heard from over these years since the book came out. Just, you know, recently got another phone call. I've, I've heard from girlfriends of Sarah's and boyfriends of Sarah's who... I had one boyfriend tell me that he had purposely uh, given her a, a drug to get her to be honest with him about what happened to her dog. Yeah. Did it work? Did anything come no, of it? No, no, she would not. She does not. She goes by a pseudonym now. She doesn't go by her name. She does have a relationship with a daughter that we did not adopt. Wow. Oddly enough, that's just strange to me, that whole thing. That daughter seems to be doing well, and I'm happy for her. Uh, Sarah has not changed her ways. She still is unstable in her job situation. She still relies on men for money. Now, in your book, you there's some suggestion that she exploited the memory of Carly to raise money for a charity. She did. But she was pocketing it. She started a charity called Carly's Angels in the same way that Trump's kids start charities. <laughs> there was nothing, like she raised money off of Carly uh, in the most exploitive way. It, it's just... It's so horrible when you look at someone like David who's actually using Carly's memory to do good things, right? you know, with the park in Corvallis, and, and that's just so sad. It's like another, another knife in the gut for him. It is. I mean, it has been, it's been devastating. I, I, there's just no other way around it. I mean, those of us who knew Carly and who know David, and I, look, I've met the whole, sh you know, Carly's grandmother and aunts and that whole thing. Um, there, you, there's no getting, you don't get over that. Like you don't get over it. No. Uh, 
there there's nothing anybody who's lost anybody knows that right there's no such thing as closure i just even hate that word i think we're the uh one of the only civilizations that uses such a word but there's no closure to this carly was a vibrant beautiful intelligent girl she would have been a firecracker of a woman uh her i'll never forget just the conversation she would have with her dad about you know when i grow up i don't want to be a mom i want to be a dad i want to go to work in an office like you you know That's so cute she idolized her dad she did she absolutely did i don't think i think carly loved her mom but i don't think carly felt safe with her mom mm -hmm. And I think that the one thing, if I could give it to every child, not just in our country, but every child in the world, it would be that sense of safety that they that they have some place that can go to where they know that they are safe and protected. I wish that for every child. I absolutely agree. And I think anyone who's read this book comes away with that as well, that that's everything. We like to donate to organizations that are important to us, of course, but also to you guys. So I wonder, are there any organizations that you would like to promote for us to support? Child advocacy centers, they're all over the country every almost every community has a child advocacy center and you can look them up online on your CAC. So I recommend that you find your nearest child advocacy center that you volunteer for them that you donate to them that you can always use funding um, and that you support them in whatever way that you can do that and the Corvallis region, that's the ABC house. They are more so than any other organization out there are solely focused on protecting that child. That's wonderful. And then what about you? Where can we learn more about your work? Um, what's your website? So my website is karenzach.com. So it's just K-R-E-N-Z-A-C-H.com. Thanks again to Karen for taking time to talk with us about Carly. If you want to know more about the Carly Sheehan case and the details around her family, check out A Silence of Mockingbirds or the ebook version Carly Sheehan True Crime Story Behind Carly's Law. In Karen's book, she said, quote, We blame God when children die as a way of deflecting the truth, a way to shift responsibility away from the real source, ourselves. What I took away from her book is that we're all to blame. Everyone in Carly's life had an opportunity to stop this. DHS officials had an opportunity to stop this. Our government had an opportunity to stop this. So we all have an opportunity to stop this from happening again. Each of us can do our part, whether it's making a donation to a local child abuse intervention center, volunteering your time to programs near you, or just arming yourself with knowledge about child abuse signs. And if you recognize a sign, report it. It shouldn't just be teachers and daycare providers who are calling. Any of us have the ability to call. I was going to say most, uh, you know, especially in Portland, but um, most numbers for uh, reporting child abuse, they're a really easy number. You know, it's like a 555, 5555. Don't call that one. Yeah, I don't, don't know call, if that's it's right. Not, it's not a real number. You know, but put that in your phone. And it's not that scary to call. It's not bad if you call and you're wrong you know i've called plenty of times when i'm like listen this kid said this one thing yeah and i have to call on the one thing and they'll take your information and sometimes they're the nicest people and sometimes they're a little impatient but it's fine yep you just give them your information the kids information anything you have as far as like their name where they live or where they go to school anything you know about them so just if you're going to make the call write those things down what you know about the child what you're calling about and they'll walk you through it don't be scared to call don't think it's on somebody else because you're the somebody else. So look up your local DHS or child abuse reporting hotline and get comfortable with the idea of calling it if you see something or hear something. Well said. Oh, 
we should get some ear candles. I keep looking for oh, yeah, them. Yeah, you keep teasing me about well, it. Well, every time I go to the I'm store, in. I can't find them, and no one will help me. The pharmacist is always busy. Susan's in the house, baby. Just wait till I get to my story. One and Boom, done. no edits. I can't wait. It's all the same. What do we pay you for? <laughs> Nothing. We don't pay, don't pay him. That's right. <laughs> That's why it's funny. I don't know anything about my history, genetically, health-wise, really. Other than that everyone's depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that everybody's family? They're actually of... Uh, Mexican yes. descent. Yeah. Um, right. We forget because... <laughs> lo siento. So lo white. siento. De nada, de nada. <laughs> when I decided that if quarantine is over in time for my birthday next year, I'm going to do a themed <gasps> costume party, Drop Dead Gorgeous, and I called From dibs the pageant? From any of it. So I called dibs on cross dance. I might have to bring a couple of outfits. That's fair. And just change. Oh, we, I mean, if you could hit every routine through the thing, that'd be great, too. Huh. Yeah. Can I dress as Miss Congeniality? <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn. Wrong movie. Mm -hmm. Yes, that would be great. I mean, it, we'd accept it. Thank sure. You. Anyway, I'm not saying you're sloppy. I'm just saying it's still it, that's a sloppy. Why situation. I've had sex with like five of your it's boyfriends. A sloppy situation. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, my God. If you had to. No, it, I don't want to play this pick game. One, it's a long one. list to choose from. I whatever. Eat okay, fuck my face. I get it. I'm horrible. I'll shut up now. Can I just get the quote right. <laughs> virginity is what you want it to be. I'm right. a virgin. So I lost my virginity. Um, not yet. I haven't lost it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I gotta go pick up my kid. No, we would just carry him. He'd just be a little potato sack man. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, can we, we wear a little backpack? Little backpack? Yeah, please. <laughs> I got a Josh in my backpack. Wait, seriously though, do we need help? No, I'm just making bad decisions because I'm bored and horny. Yeah, me too. I have had chicken nuggets four You've times never this week. Been horny in your life. <laughs> yes, I have. The relationship blossom blossomed. <laughs> <laughs> I loved that show. That show, Tommy. That was my guts. <laughs> That was a lower gut thing, though. That was Ooh. south of tummy. Was that a, <laughs> uh oh, my it asshole was, better not part? It was, farther, it was way farther south than I wanted it to be. <laughs> oh, wait. You probably would want that. I've already said I don't want to have sex with you. Pfft, nobody wants to have sex with you. <laughs> you think you're so special? Everybody's in that club, motherfucker. <laughs> That didn't go the way I had intended it. <laughs> Her grandmother, grandmother, that they were aware of just who it was they rewarded. Just, oh my God. Oh, tell me. We were all sitting around one day and we were like, let's go through our list of everyone. And we decided this was like a Saturday morning after going out. We're like, let's just make a list of all of our bases and all of the guys. You know, first, second, third, home. And we go, and we're like, you know, we're like, I don't even know what happened. And we're sitting there, we all get to the end, and we're going through the list. And I was like, oh, making out. Da -da 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 Obviously, you guys. And they both look, they're like, what? They both forgot that we all made out together. <laughs> Wait, you and Jamie, Jamie and, and Emily. Emily. The three of you made out. Yes, at the like, same I moment. I mean, so she says. <laughs> wow. And they both forgot. And I was like, um, well, I could tell you every detail because it was crazy, but okay. <laughs> That's crazy. That was in my grandparents' pool, right? Yes. <laughs> and everybody, we all had gum, and Isaac was like jumping, and then I'm flashing your grandma. And Murder in the Rain is produced and edited by Josh McCullough, written and hosted by Emily Rowney and Alicia Holland, artwork by Jamie Costa, music by Kai Pfeiffer at kyfifer.com. Check out our website, murderintherain.com, for additional information on all cases, a fun interactive map, and be sure to subscribe so you can receive our newsletter. Check out the Mad Props page for coupon codes from some of our sponsors. We love your reviews and seeing them on all streaming platforms, especially iTunes. And check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And suck my balls. <laughs> Please put that in. <laughs>